Hello, and welcome to Based on a True Story, the podcast that compares your favorite Hollywood movies with history. Today, we're going to learn about the 2020 movie all about Nikola Tesla that's simply called Tesla. To help us separate fact from fiction in the movie, we'll be chatting with author Richard Munson, who has an excellent biography of Nikola Tesla called Tesla, Inventor of the Modern. But first, here on Based on a True Story, we need you to participate in our game. If you're new to the show, here's how it works. I'm about to say three things. Two of them are true, and that means one of them is a lie. Are you ready? Okay, here they are. Number one, Tesla abhorred jewelry on women. Number two, one of the driving forces in Tesla's life was to please his grandmother. Number three, at one time when Tesla was about to win an award, he disappeared to go feed pigeons in a park. Got him? Okay, now as you're listening to our story today, your challenge is to find the two facts scattered somewhere throughout the episode. Maybe it'll be obvious, maybe not. Can you find the lie? And we'll do a recap at the end of the episode to see how well you did. All right, now it's time to connect with Richard Munson about the historical accuracy of Tesla. We all know movies are entertainment and not supposed to be entirely accurate. But before we dive into some of the details of the movie, if you had to give this movie a letter grade on the historical accuracy of Tesla's life, what would it get? Uh, can I give two yeah. grades? I mean, one, I, I would give, I'd give an A for the fact that this is probably the first movie that Hollywood did that's really focused on Nikola Tesla, who I think has been an overlooked and, to be honest, even abused in some regards by Hollywood. Uh, on total historical accuracy, probably a B, B minus. Um, but I'm not sure that really matters. Um, I mean, what, you know, the point of movies and all artist artistry is to come up with sort of an image, some feeling, some sense. And in that way, you know, um, did in fact, um, you know, Thomas Edison and Nikola Tesla shove, you know, ice cream cones at each other? No. <laughs> but does it create the sense of the tension between them? Yes. So. Um, th those would be my two. <laughs> That's good. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, it is a movie, right? And so you got to have some of that entertainment on there, <laughs> for sure. Uh, at the beginning of the movie, we do see Nikola Tesla working at Edison Machine Works in New York City that gives a date of August 11th, 1884. We don't get a lot of Tesla's life before this, although later on in the movie, there are some kind of facts that are, are sprinkled in here. We find out that he was born in 1853 in a small rural village in what's now Croatia. Uh, he went to school in Prague to study engineering, but he never graduated from there, according to the movie. And then he came to America with hopes and dreams. So the movie doesn't really give a lot about Tesla's early life. Can you fill in some more of the historical record with a brief overview of Tesla's life up until the timeline of the movie? Yeah, I wish that the movie had looked a bit more at his early life, which is fascinating and also quite dramatic. Um, I mean, even his birth date, um, he was born at the stroke of midnight between the 9th and 10th of July. Um, and he was born, this man who gave us artificial lightning was born during a lightning storm. How cool is <laughs> that? Cool. You know, his, uh, the midwife, you know, was freaked out by this because it really was quite a, a lightning storm and said, oh no, he's a child of the storm. And his mother came back and said, no, 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 no. He's, he's a child of the light. We have to look at this on the positive side. But I mean, you know, even... You know, where he was born, he was a Serb that was born in Croatia. Um, he was um, part of a Orthodox Christian uh, family. His father was actually a priest in a country that was 98% Roman Catholics. So in some regard, he was a bit of an outsider to begin with. Uh, but I think the key thing about his early life that would have been useful is that you know, even though he claims it was blissful, he was doted over by two older sisters, he wrote, you know, horses. He had a cat that he thought was the greatest in the world. He had this event when he was nine years old and he had an older brother, Dane, um, that was about 15 at the time. Uh, and he was, you know, Nicola's idol and all also the, you know, glory of his father and mother. He was the, considered the brightest one and probably would be the most, you know, accomplished. And so everybody looked towards Dane. And unfortunately, when he was 15 years old, um, the, the stallion, um, that the family owned bolted and threw Dane to the ground and he died. And Nicola, um, at this early age of nine years old, 
was called by his mother at around midnight to come in and kiss his dead brother goodbye. Whoa, that's a little dramatic. And so you would think, and then the, then the important part then comes later, you would think that then the family would consider they now have one surviving son. Let's, you know, really focus our attention now on Nicola. But no, what they focused on was the fact that Nicola wasn't Dane. And if a Dane was around, he would have done things better. So Nicola, you know, spent much of his youth trying to gain his father's adoration uh, and acceptance. Um, even when he went off, finally went off to college, you know, he, you know, got masterful grades. I mean, it was at the top of his class, did everything perfect. And his father's reaction was, Dane would have done better. So Nicola, you know, at this point, we always think of him as this, you know, sort of a genius. He dropped out of school. He moved away uh, to a town and without telling anybody where he was. He took up gambling and billiards um, and he eventually got arrested for vagrancy and was brought back to his family uh, by the police. You can imagine his Orthodox father and his dear mother were just, <laughs> what did we do wrong? So I think that dynamic of, you know, having lost his beloved brother at an early age had a huge impact on him throughout his life, as well as his continuous struggles to try to, you know, come up with some creative, mindful way to impress his father. Uh, and that I think would have been helpful for uh, the movie. I want to see that movie now. I mean, that is, that's a, so, so he, he was, he was constant. It sounds like he's trying to always impress his, his father with that kind of, kind of being a, a driving force in what made, totally. made him who he is. Or was, yeah. And I mean, he even goes so far as, you know, that um, because of his striving to please his father, he began to develop what he called sort of mind games. He began to travel in his mind uh, to other places. Um, and that essentially because his inventing style became what he referred to as cerebral engineering. It all happened up here in his head. He claims that his striving to please his father was what trained him, if you will, to approach inventing in a cerebral sort of way. Wow. Do we know what his relationship was with Dane? Like, I mean, he was trying to impress his father, but I mean, just losing your brother is, a, that's a huge thing too. A huge shock. I mean, um, Nicola from all accounts seems to have looked up to his brother and thought that he was, you know, just the, the big brother that he wanted yeah. to be like. And so even, you know, had some notion well, when he wrote in his you know diary about 50 years later that the, um, vision of his dead brother still haunted him. So, wow. um, there were some historians who tried to make the case that, you know, um, Nicola had some role in his brother's death, but I think that's baloney. Um, uh, it's just, um, he just got bolted from a spooked horse. Um, and uh, Nicola was crushed and obviously his parents were also, and continued to hope that Nicola would be, would, um, you know, not replace but, Dane, but, you know, try and live up to, um, who had been the, the joy of the yeah, family. Wow. Wow. That's yeah. That, that's a lot left out for, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but if we do head back to the movie, we see uh, Tesla at the uh, Edison machine works and we get a, a sense for how Edison yes. ran his company. There's always a lot of work to do. Edison himself hardly yes. ever seems to sleep. He expects his employees to work even harder than he does. Uh, he talks to everyone, but doesn't really listen to anyone else. Uh, there's a scene that I thought was pretty telling uh, where Edison tells Tesla that alternating current is a waste of time. Then Edison yeah. mentions something about how Tesla thinks that he owes him $50,000. Edison's refusing to pay it. And so Tesla just gets up and walks out. What was it like for Tesla when he worked for Edison and how did their working relationship end? The relationship actually began when Tesla got his first job in Budapest, uh, installing Edison telephone systems, both in Budapest and then later in Paris. Um, the Edison company's European representative recognized the genius of this young man and sent him to New York with probably the greatest letter of recommendation you could ever have. He wrote to Edison. He said, I know of two great men. One of them is you, <laughs> flattering Thomas Edison. And the other is this young man who's standing in front of you. So Tesla obviously got a job working with, you know, the wizard of Menlo Park. Um, and they had, a, you know, a great relationship in the sense they both worked incredibly hard. They were both brilliant. Um, they barely slept. 
and yet they were two totally different, you know, temperaments. Um, Edison, to be honest, was rather crass, rumpled. Um, Tesla, in comparison, was this European cosmopolitan. He spoke about eight languages. You know, he would dress most days as though he was going to an opera. They did have differences, as you noted, between, you know, Edison liking direct current and Tesla liking alternating. We might come back and talk about that. But, you know, the thing that really tipped the scales was what you had mentioned on this $50,000 of thing. This was an issue, at least from Tesla's perspective, where Edison had offered him a bonus of approximately $50,000 if, in fact, he was able to vastly increase the efficiency of Edison generators. So Tesla spent, you know, evenings, weekends, I mean, just a tremendous amount of creative energy to, in fact, triple uh, the output and efficiency of um, what had been the basic Edison generators. And so he goes to the great man who he highly respects and says, you know, I've done what you've asked, you know, where's my bonus? And Edison, crass, rumpled, grumpy man that he was, laughs at him. He laughs at him. And then, you know, in a slight that only an immigrant can feel, you know, you know, sort of a stab to the heart, he says, when you become a real American, you'll appreciate an American joke. And so Tesla, of course, found nothing funny to be laughing about this, picked up his bowler hat and walked out the door. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) Yeah, I want to ask, there's something else that the movie kind of implies. um, And you're talking about uh, Tesla losing his brother and and then his uh, trying to impress his father being a driving force. According to the movie, it mentions that Edison lost his wife, uh, Mary, at age mm-hmm. 25 and get the impression that he was just grief stricken, which is completely understandable. And then the impression I got from the movie was that was his driver as to why Edison was the workaholic that he was. He just threw himself into his work. Is there any truth to that? I think he was a workaholic before his wife died. I mean, he just that's just who he was. Um, and, you know, they had. Tesla and Edison had totally different inventing styles. I mean, Edison was a trial and error guy. You know, he put out on a big table, tons of little pieces of wire or, you know, string or whatever. And he tried, you know, piece them together in a way to make them work. And he was brilliant at it. I mean, uh, not discounting, you know, what he did, but it really was kind of just hodgepodge trial and error. Tesla in comparison, as mentioned before, did everything in his mind, the cerebral engineering, he would concoct what a machine would look like and make adjustments to it in his mind before it was ever done. And he actually made fun of Edison thinking that if Edison had the foggiest idea about, you know, some basic mathematical, you know, formulas, he would have saved tons and tons of time, but that wasn't the way Edison worked. And, you know, obviously Edison, you know, had unbelievable inventions and it's not a criticism of him, but that's, that they just had different styles uh, about what they did. And I think Edison was like that all of his life. <laughs> okay. I have to ask then because you earlier when you mentioned that, uh, I don't remember who, who it was that, you know, wrote to Edison and said, there's two people, right? You and somebody else obviously catering yeah. to Edison. And then this idea of, of Tesla kind of making fun of Edison there was Edison, uh, lack of a better term, an egomaniac. Like he didn't, <laughs> he liked people, uh, praising him and, and not so much the other way around. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that, you know, That's not unusual for brilliant inventors and entrepreneurs. You have to have unbelievable self-confidence that you know the better way. And so, again, I'm not knocking Edison as a result of that, but that's sort of an attribute. You know, look at people, you know, today who we look to as, you know, great entrepreneurs. They're not exactly (laughs) wallflowers. Fair point. Fair point. (laughs) Uh, according to the movie, after a year of digging ditches for Western Union, he's digging phone lines. Uh, one of the foremen introduces Tesla to a lawyer named Alfred S. Brown and an electrician named Charles F. Peck. Brown and Peck like the idea of alternating current, and they set up Tesla with a lab, give him $250 a month salary to work on his motor that's going to generate, transmit, and utilize the power. Is that a pretty good summary of how Tesla got investors to work on AC power? Yeah. Um, just to put it in context, I mean, Tesla, after he walked out of the Edison place, um, gathered some investors to set up an electrical system in Rahway, New Jersey. Um, he was successful in doing that, but he thought Tesla thought that these investors would also allow him to expand 
this alternating current system to other cities across the country. So he'd build a big empire, if you will. The investors basically screwed him, mm. um, which was a common theme throughout Tesla's life. He was a horrible businessman. Um, and so um, after getting shunned by this company and having his stock that he thought was valuable become essentially worthless, he got stuck digging ditches for about a year uh, for $2 a day. Imagine that, you know, this cosmopolitan, brilliant scientist is digging ditches. He's not your regular, ordinary dick ditch digger because they were, um, you know, every day the foreman would have to hear from Nikola about how this telegraph wire could be made more efficient or the machinery on the other end <laughs> could be improved. And so essentially at some point he said, all right, let's bring in a few other people to talk to you. And, you know, he got at this point was probably the most important thing is the, that he got guidance from a uh, particularly legal guidance as to how to run a business because he didn't have that himself. Um, and unfortunately didn't last long. Um, but that's sort of what's, what was missing in his life. And they introduced him, um, they gave him some money, but the key thing that they did was introduce him to George Westinghouse, who at the time was trying to figure out how to create electrical systems in competition to the larger Edison systems. And Westinghouse was particularly interested in alternating current. Okay. Okay. That, that was definitely an impression I got from the movie that Tesla was not very much of a businessman. But on the flip side of that, I also got the impression that Edison kind of was. I think there was a, a mention from those two investors mm -hmm. that Tesla was making $15 a week working for Edison. And they made some sort of a kind of an offhand comment in there saying something like, Edison likes to hire the best, but he practically makes them pay <laughs> to work for him. Is that something that was true? He was cheap <laughs> I mean, he, and he was, you know, it was an honor. I mean, Tesla himself, you know, was thrilled to be able to work with the great man. I mean, he was, you know, the great inventor at the time. So yes, he was able to attract talent uh, and he paid them poorly and he worked them really hard, but no harder than he worked himself. Um, the, um, going back to Westinghouse, I think that's the key, um, you know, relationship that got developed. I mean, because Westinghouse thought that alternating current could compete against Edison's direct current. And as a result, Westinghouse thought that he could build these systems and, you know, make a whole lot of money. So he paid Tesla not only money for his patents, which made Tesla relatively rich, but gave him a, a royalty on each electric motor that the Westinghouse company would make. That ended up being worth um, hundreds and of millions of dollars. And if I might, just because this is going back to the point of how horrible of a businessman <laughs> Tesla was, you know, at some point, you know, Westinghouse got overextended. I mean, he, um, we can come back to these, but he you know, was engaged with the Chicago, um, exhibition of 1893 and he, you know, captured the power from Niagara Falls and brought it to New York he, in the process of doing that. He spent a lot of money, but he also got stretched thin financially. And so his investors were going to him and saying, Westinghouse, you got to cut back some money. So he goes to Tesla, which is uh, in part in the movie, uh, and says, you know, I'm, I'm really broke here. I'm sort of struggling. Is there anything that you can do to help me? You know, and Tesla asks, well, if I tear up, you know, my royalty contract, would that be useful? <laughs> and, and Tesla right in front of him tears up this contract, which some people would estimate would be have been equivalent of about a billion dollars in today's money that he just tore up because he said to Westinghouse, you have trusted me and I believe in you that you will make my system the reality for the rest of the country. That sort of trust, that vision of bringing his invention to the world <laughs> and being a horrible <laughs> businessman in the process, he gave away a billion dollars. Um, just remarkable that yeah we, we will come to back back to that for sure <laughs> <laughs> but i, I want to you're talking about uh ac you know alternating current and and direct current and the movie does kind of explain this briefly it um, made a big deal about how tesla's motor uh, eliminated the uh, commutator and the sparks that go with That's it right. uh, they say that yep. it's more efficient than edison's direct current and it basically explains that direct current is like a river flowing peacefully to the sea. Alternating current is like 
a, a current rushing violently over a precipice. That's the way the terminology that the movie used to explain these differences. Yes. Is that a pretty good explanation of the different with, I mean, obviously I'm sure it's a lot more detailed. Large, largely that was, that, that was Edison's view of the difference between the two of them. Um, the key difference is that, um, alternating current can be sent over longer distances. Um, and direct current, if uh, you know, can only go for you know a couple hundred yards. So, if in fact we only had direct current generators, we would have you know electrical generators burning coal or whatever they were burning at the time. You know, basically spaced off every one or two wow. blocks. What alternating current does, which is the system that we mostly use today, is that it's what's referred to as step up the voltage um, at, right at the generator and then send this high voltage electricity over long distance transmission lines, hundreds of miles. Uh, and then we have transformers basically in all, near all of our houses. You can look up the poles. There's these little, you know, gray, you know, boxes that are transformers that step down the electricity and to a voltage that can be used inside your house. And so what well, it was certainly more efficient, but it was also why it was efficient was that it was able to travel over long distances and bring electricity to more and more people. But this, this battle between direct and alternating current became a, you know, an ugly, ugly struggle. Um, it was referred to as the war of the currents. Um, and I think it revealed n not the best side of Thomas Edison because the things that he did to try and dis alternating current to protect his own investment were shocking, if not, you know, downright gruesome. That was an impression I got from the movie as, as well. And I'll ask you if, if how accurate this is, I guess, was Edison almost seemed going back to being egotistical. He was stuck in his like, this is my way and, and this is that. And then uh, whereas Tesla seemed very much like this thinking his way was better, but not so much because he thought he was going to make a ton of money off of it. Like Edison was, I don't know, I guess the driver I got from the movie was Edison wants to make a bunch of money off this and, and Tesla just wants to do what he thinks is best. But I mean, Edison's smart guy. Mm -hmm. Did he, th did he, I mean, he had to have known yeah. that this is better, right? <laughs> or maybe that's a trick question. Sorry. <laughs> um, you know, I guess once you get invested as deeply as he was in a particular technology, it is really hard to make an adjustment as big as this would have required. So yes, I think you're accurate that Edison uh, brilliantly figured out how to make direct current work um, and send it over short distances. Um, but he just was, uh, and his focus was on making money. Whereas Tesla had sort of this vision, he was going to bring power to the world, you know, almost free power uh, to the entire world. So you had this entrepreneur versus this idealist um, between the two of them and their struggle, um, I think, defined sort of um, industrialized America, you know, in the early uh, 20th century and um, also just created a, you know, both an ugly business war, but also, a, you know, a technical and gruesome war as, as well. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you did talk about this a little bit earlier. I want to circle back to the some of the the money that Tesla did make, and according to the way the movie explains it, uh, with Westinghouse the buys the patents, uh, the movie suggests that it was over a million dollars in today's money. And then, of course, you mentioned mm -hmm. also that uh, Tesla would get royalties for each motor in what's called the horsepower clause, uh, and that the movie says is going to assure millions more for years to come. And uh, Westinghouse yep. then hires Tesla to also oversee the production of it all. The movie didn't really yep. mention whether or not he's getting an extra salary for that or not, or if that's kind of included. But we do see a time and place of uh, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, August 14th, 1888. Is that pretty accurate as far as how Tesla did make money off of his invention before tearing it all up? <laughs> yes. I mean, for a while, Tesla was doing extremely well. Um, Westinghouse did bring him to Pittsburgh and help him um, organize things. Um, Tesla, however, did not really uh, fit in well with Westinghouse engineers um, who, you know, were not, you know, as brilliant as, as he was or thought he was. <laughs> uh, and, and they were also sort of regimented in sort of a corporate mentality, whereas Tesla was more this free thinking idealist. But he did make him, he was pretty flush for a while. He had a nice, um, 
you know, apartment in the Waldorf Astoria, the great hotel of New York City at the time. He spent most of his dinners at Delmonico's um, eating. He loved particularly steak most every night. Um, and so he was doing fine, thank you. Um, and, you know, he ran into some problems associated with the fire in his laboratory, but he also faced, you know, just sheer business stupidity by tearing up this royalty contract. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I, I like that you mentioned that the, there was the, the corporate side for the engineers there. The I could definitely see how that would be a case where if, if Edison is running his company and he's this workaholic that's just driving everything, um, but it sounds like Westinghouse was running the company that Tesla was working for. So Tesla wasn't, it sounds like he wasn't necessarily involved in who's working and the, and the work regiments and, and all that. And so they're not quite as driven as he was. Well, Westinghouse was certainly one driven man, but he had a different mm -hmm. approach. I mean, he would, he trusted his other engineers and his team far more, I think, than did um, Edison and certainly the independent, you know, Tesla. So, you know, I think, at, you know, Westinghouse is one of the underappreciated geniuses uh, uh, that we don't know much about because he didn't keep many notes, but um, he w worked incredibly hard with sort of drawing constantly, you know, from his own, you know, um, library to, you know, when he was being driven to the car where he had his own railroad railway car that he was constantly drawing up new designs for his engineers to develop so hmm. uh, going back to kind of the, this war between edison and tesla there are a couple parts in the movie where we see edison go to some pretty extreme lengths to fight tesla's growing popularity uh there's a, a guy named uh, harold p brown he works for edison he buys some of tesla's ac motors he gets 24 dogs electrocutes them with 1400 volts of uh, edison's direct current the dog survives and then he uses 400 to 800 volts of the westinghouse alternating current and the dog dies and yep. that proves i'm using quotes here for listening on audio <laughs> that ac power is not <laughs> safe while dc power is uh, there's another tactic that we see in the movie where um, there's an axe murderer named William Kemmler. He's sentenced to death. And instead of hanging, Edison is the one who convinces them to electrocute him with a Westinghouse machine. And so showing just how dangerous AC power is. It's the first use, according to the movie, of an electric chair. Did Edison actually do those things? Every one of them and wow. more. <laughs> I mean, not only dogs, he did cats, he did monkeys, he did sheep, he did horses. I mean, you, you pick an animal that he, um, wanted to prove could be killed as a result of, um, what he referred to as elect, um, Westinghouse, um, you know, as a way from a public relations campaign to try and diss, you know, his biggest competitor. Um, and the, the Kimmler, you know, ass assassination or I guess execution, um, was stunning because Edison actually lobbied the New York state a legislature to allow um, electrocution as a, a better and more humane approach to um, execution than a fiery squad or, you know, um, a hanging. And it was unbelievably botched. Um, and they brought him in and they, you know, had as often, I guess I've never been to one, but to an electrocution and you have reporters and, you know, people that are associated with the trial watching this. And so, you know, they, shoot, I guess, 400 volts, you know, and the guy jerks around, but he's still obviously alive. They up that, uh, you know, double it and he jerks around more and starts oozing goo, um, you know, and they up it again. I mean, it's absolutely gross. The New York times reporter was beside himself. He just said everybody was throwing up and, you know, was groaning about how horrible it was. And so, you know, I, I think the general population looked at that report and said, Edison, you're out of your mind, you know, um, what are you doing, you know, causing this pain to animals and to, you know, trying to, um, have an electrocution and, um, but it, it was amazing the lengths to which, you know, Thomas Edison would go to advance, you know, his public relations associated with what, with what he thought was his electric impact. Wow. Wow. Well, I, I think we do see that in the movie where the electrocution yeah. get botched a little bit. He doesn't die the first attempt. Uh, and then they, yeah, they, they up it again. And, and that, I mean, they were nice in the movie because at least by all the reports, it was far more. Yeah. Well, yeah I'm thankful um, for that. I don't want to see that. And a, and a, and a, I'm not suggesting the movie. No, yeah. Sort of more <laughs> yeah. Realistic There's times show. where it's good not to be as, as accurate. That's for sure. Yep. <laughs> but I so agree. if, if the, 
if that was, uh, it sounds like more of a PR push, right? To kind of be uh, Westinghouse. Where you, anytime we turn something into a verb, it, you know, that is a, a PR yep. thing. Um, did that backfire at all on Edison? You sounds like if, if in that article, if people are saying, oh, Edison, you're crazy. Like that backfire on him that they realized that he was behind this. I think it did actually. Um, and it opened up the opportunity for Westinghouse to be able to win the contract to power and light uh, the Chicago World Exhibition of um, 1893. And that was, you know, sort of turned the page because here, this vast, you know, just south of Chicago, this opening, which millions of Americans and foreigners came to look at the wonders of American industrial power. And it was all being powered by a Westinghouse electric generator that was based on Tesla designs. Mm -hmm. And they had hundreds of thousands of light bulbs. I mean, it was the, you know, the white city as it was referred to. Um, and I think at that point sort of showed the potential and, and the, the reality of the potential for uh, alternating current in the system that Nikola Tesla had envisioned. Wow. wow. We, we do say that in the movie. I'll come back to that in a second, because there's a couple uh, points that I wanted to ask about in the timeline of the movie that happened before that. One of them is a, a relationship between Tesla and a lady named Anne Morgan. She's the daughter of J.P. Morgan. Yes. Uh, her father had been pouring millions into Edison's General Electric Company. Uh, so it was a little bit seems a little awkward there. <laughs> but the impression that I got from the movie was that Ann Morgan had a thing for Tesla, but he didn't really see her in a romantic way. Uh, he instead had a thing for another international superstar, Sarah Bernhardt. What was Tesla's romantic life like? <laughs> <laughs> is that is that laugh just the answer? I, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, you're talking about this man who was a germaphobe, um, who, I mean, he was brilliant, but um, he abhorred jewelry on women. Uh, he would get a rash if he saw a peach. Uh, he would have to count his steps. And if they were not divisible by three, he would do the entire walk all over wow. again. The guy had some quirks. <laughs> um, and when it came to women, you know, the thought of physical contact, um, this he was not exactly the most romanticizing, you know, individual. That said, however, he was a flirt. He loved <laughs> <laughs> chatting up and uh you know uh, women and because he you know was this european cosmopolitan and tall and handsome i mean he he was a, a, a charmer um and ann morgan uh was charmed by him they met at her sister's wedding uh and then she ann invited uh tesla to the morgan mansion thanksgiving dinner at which point afterwards he regaled the entire crowd with his, you know, electrical sparks across the room, his dancing with, you know, light bulbs that were glowing without being attached to wires. I mean, doing all these amazing sorts of things. Um, I think, you know, the relationship that they suggested in the movie was not historically an accurate one, but I thought was incredibly clever, you know, for their ability to use her as the voice of reality mm. um, into this, to looking back and saying, you know, here's what, you know, was really going on. Uh, in this. Um, so yes, she had a thing for him. Yes. He had sort of, you know, a flirtatious relationship with Sarah Bernhardt. He, had, he says that he only had really one love of his life, which, you know, happened in Europe in Budapest when he was about 19 years old, but that lasted only a summer, mm -hmm. uh, because he went off to engineering school and she, um, you know, went off, you know, to, um, have babies with another one, an individual who was willing to have a romantic relationship. <laughs> Wow. Okay. Yeah. That, I want you talking about the, the light bulbs to change a little bit, but you're talking about the light bulbs with power without being connected to anything. Do people see that as magic or, I mean, could they understand the, the science of it? Oh, I think they totally saw it as magic. <laughs> I, I mean, I'd see it as magic you know, the, now. <laughs> the weird part is, you know, um, you know, this man who we sort of have this image of as being this isolated, weird, you know, um, individualized inventor. He was actually a showman hmm. um, and would on numerous occasions pack in hundreds, if not thousands of people to come watch him, you know, send sparks, you know, 50 feet across the stage, or as I said, to grab globes, you know, which were electrified by, you know, basically um, generators on either side of the stage that were sending, you know, electrostatic signals that would allow the bulbs to be lit even though they were not connected to wires and so yes this was this was magic no one had ever seen this 
you know, stuff before. So he was the great mu magician, uh, but he also was an idealist who thought that this new power, which even he admitted that um, nobody fully understands. And I think even physicists today would sort of say, it's a pretty weird <laughs> form of energy. I mean, this movement of electrons will, you know, along, you know, a conductor, I mean, it, it is strange, but he was able to, you know, capture and utilize and manipulate um, this source of power, which before uh, had been reserved for the gods or for yeah. lightning. But he did it more doing those shows. If he wasn't really as much of a businessman, I would, I could, I guess I could see a contrast here again, going back to Edison. If he would do something like that, he would do it because that's going to bring in money, right? That's a business thing, bring in a lot of people. It sounds like Tesla did it because he liked like the showmanship or the, the you know, what the, the ad, ad, adoration that comes from that sort of thing. Well, I think he also wanted to blow people's minds. Yeah. I mean, he wanted to, to I mean, he had this vision of what this new power source could do, uh, as far as, you know, in revolutionizing, you know, American industry, as well as, you know, uh, getting rid of the drudgery that was, you know, life without electricity. I mean, <laughs> we can't even imagine, you know, you know, we had to candles or, you know, had to adjust the, you know, the wicks of, of lanterns or, you know, we had to, um, smash our clothes against rocks and, and hang them outside to, you know, to dry. I mean, life before electricity was really <laughs> drudgery. And so he, Tesla had this sort of vision. He was going to reduce that drudgery and also create, you know, an industry, um, a, a an economy that would bring riches and, um, and benefits to basically everyone around hmm. the world. Hmm. I want to ask about uh, another character that we see in the movie. It's Tesla's assistant, somebody named Antoni Zagetti. And he's been by Tesla's, Tesla's side for years, according to the movie. And then at one yes. point in the movie, uh, he shows Tesla a compass that he invented. Tesla's like, oh, that's already been done. <laughs> uh, Zagetti just gets up, walks out of the room. Later, Tesla tells Anne that he went to South America to seek his fortune. It's kind of odd, I thought, the way the movie handled it. You know, he's been an assistant for years, <laughs> and then... All of a sudden, he just kind of gets up and leaves. Can you fill in some more historical context around that? There's uh, unfortunately, there's not a whole lot. Yes, they were, you know, together for um, an extended period of time. They worked um, in Europe um, on, you know, the original designs for an electric motor um, together. So they were sort of joined at the hip for a long time. It, it appears as though um, Tesla increasingly saw Zagetti as talented, but not a genius. Mm. Um, and so therefore they were sort of not on the same plane. And so when this idea for a compass came forward, I mean, Tesla was, you know, sort of really like that's been done before. Um, and for Zagetti, who was, you know, trying to impress this person who had been his friend, his colleague, his, you know, right hand, um, best buddy, um, it was crushing. Mm. Um, to have this rejection of, no, you're not really as bright as you need to be. And what you've come up with is second rate. Wow. Um, and so he did, in fact, leave. And um, by all accounts that I've seen is that he did go to South America and ended up dying there. Wow. Was Tesla, did Te would Tesla do something like that on purpose? Or was he just not that empathetic and just didn't even realize that how, <laughs> how crushing this would be to somebody else? My impression is... Um, Social skills were not his strength. <laughs> so social and business skills, not so yeah, much I, for Tesla. I don't, think he, I don't think he appreciated that, you know, well, and you're, you're dealing with a, a genius who, you know, Zagetti was also a very bright guy, uh, but he just wasn't in the same league, if you will, um, as Nikola. And Nikola didn't appreciate that his best friend, to be quite honest, you know, needed some acclamation every now and then. And he wasn't getting, I mean, it. how many people throughout history on the same league as Tesla, right? So, I mean, it's kind of tough yeah. there. <laughs> yeah. Probably true. Uh, you mentioned this earlier and go back to in the movie, we see the world's fair in Chicago, 1893. Uh, according to the movie, Westinghouse set up a pavilion of light. The fair consumes yes. three times more electricity, than the entire city itself. Uh, according to the movie, there's this display, 28 million visitors to the world's fair can see for themselves that AC power is beautiful and safe. And this is something that uh, the way the timeline of the movie it comes soon after all the, you know, Edison's trying to prove that AC power is 
is yep. terrible and and, and yep. uh, dangerous. And so this kind of comes off as no, it's beautiful, it's safe, it can do this uh, what we want it to do. Was that a pretty good interpretation of what really happened at the World's Fair? Yes. Um, and I think not only did millions of visitors from around the world come and see the reality of alternating current in the systems, the electric motors that Tesla had designed, but it opened the door for probably the biggest electrical project of the era. And that was capturing the power from Niagara Falls um, and using that to send electricity initially to Buffalo, about 23 miles away, and then 400, a stunning 400 miles all the way down to New York City. Now, remember, direct current could go a couple hundred yards. And here was the clear example that you could send power 400 miles. Mm -hmm. um, it allowed, think about the changes that it allowed. It allowed the underground electrified subway system of New York. It created the Great White Way of Broadway because suddenly you could have all these light bulbs. I mean, so it was a stunning achievement. Um, bringing sort of the, the fear like, um, advances to the reality of creating an electrical system of capturing the power from, you know, a waterfall and bringing electricity 400 miles to New York. I just have to blow your mind. Like at that point, I, I, I wouldn't even know what would be capable. Cause it just blow your mind. Like I never even would never even think about that. I mean, there's so, I mean, there's so many inventions <laughs> now, even that, you know, you're like, oh, this is amazing but I don't know what I can do with it. Cause I don't know what I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, But I mean, I, you know, I think, you know, Tesla and his genius was that he had some vision that, for what this electric motor and alternating current system could yeah. do. And I think he thought that, you know, he could bring it to um, New York city and it would change mm. life. Um, both in the way that, you know, we, are transported it allowed elevators and therefore larger buildings you know to be you know had it transformed you know sort of the the skyscape of new york city and uh, as i said before reduced the drudgery of millions yeah. of people wow yeah and that's a big part of it to to give some of those ideas to, to others to what can be done with this as well uh, mm. you, you, uh, something else you alluded to earlier that uh, the movie does show as when uh, edison merges with some new companies westinghouse tells tesla that they're going to have to do the same in order to keep up with Edison. But Westinghouse says um, his board of directors refused to go through with any sort of merger and, until they cancel the horsepower clause in Tesla's contract. And they have to pay Tesla what's spelled out in his contract. Westinghouse is saying that the entire company is, is going to go bust. So according to the movie, Westinghouse is the one that kind of convinces Tesla to cancel the clause so that Westinghouse can maintain control of the company. Merger will go through and as he puts it in the movie, the entire country will be put on AC. Now, the movie does, I got the impression that Westinghouse was really trying to be genuine, and Tesla also seemed to put his trust in Westinghouse, according to the movie as well. But I did get the impression that it was Westinghouse kind of driving that. Tesla didn't really care about the money, so he was happy to give that up. We, we see him tearing that contract. Was the movie's interpretation of this pretty accurate? It was pretty close. Um I think, you know, as I mentioned before, that when Westinghouse, who Tesla really trusted, and I think was a, a quite an honest businessman, um, you know, in comparison to, you know, the um, war of the current, um, you know, activities of the Wizard of Midlow <laughs> Park, Westinghouse was pretty calm. Um, but he laid out, you know, his financial situation and Tesla, as you noted, wasn't that interested in money, even though he, you know, Admittedly, he was staying at the Waldorf Astoria and eating dinners at Delmonico's. So it's not like he was a hermit. Uh, and he can enjoy he the money, even though you don't. Well yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, so he, he comes back. Um, you know, I think Westinghouse laid out the problem and um, Tesla took the bait of saying that, you know, his ideal was to have Westinghouse, who had been his friend and promoter, you know, take his inventions and bring them to the world. And if that required him tearing up his royalty contract, no big deal. <laughs> if that was a billion dollars. That's a pretty big deal. But <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. Other than that, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, according to the movie, Tesla explains to JP Morgan um, that he's going to Colorado, right? He, he's going to do some uh, 
you got like a 300 horsepower oscillator to run simultaneous operations at any point in the globe. So he's starting to take on what I got. The impression was some other inventions outside of, you know, the, the AC side. Um, and we see him you know, putting apparatus on the ground. Doesn't matter if it's a few miles or a few thousand miles. The concept here is that you can transmit messages to a receiving post. So, you know, signal steamships anywhere at sea or obtain instantaneous yep. stock quotes sent from the East Coast or the West Coast, something that, you know, these days we don't really think twice about, but, you know, back then it's just, you know, crazy to think about. Yep. Morgan offers Tesla $100,000 in the movie to get it done. We find out later that Morgan ended up giving him another $50,000. I think the movie mentioned something about this, about the same as $4 million in today's money. Can you fill in some more historical details around this new idea that Tesla had and being backed by JP Morgan? Well, just to make it clear, JP Morgan covered his bets. Um, he in, invested in both Edison and Tesla. Um, he invented in, invested in both Marconi and Tesla as mm. to who could, you know, transmit, you know, wireless communication. Um, and he also probably spent more money on a single painting than he did um, in all of his investments into, you know, the Tesla business. So you have to put this man in some perspective. I mean, he was a, uh, ruthless banker looking out for ways to monopolize various industries, be that steel, copper, what have you, that he had done before and was thinking about how to do that with both communications and power. The new idea that T Tesla came up with, which, you know, to be honest, ended up being, um, not feasible or he just went in the wrong direction. He decided that instead of sending power over electrical lines, over long distances, uh, or sending communications wirelessly through the air, what he would do is that he'd send power into the earth. You would get a, you know, a huge bolt, like a, you know, a bolt of lightning would strike the earth and Tesla realized that that bolt of lightning, when it hit the earth would sort of echo down through the globe and then echo its way back up to him. And he thought, well, I could do that. Mm. And by doing that, I could allow people anywhere in the globe to plug into the earth and obtain both messages as well as free electrical power. Brilliant idea. Um, so, and Morgan sort of appreciated that really what he wanted was you know, some wireless technology that would allow him to get stock boats while he was out on his yacht in the middle of the Atlantic. <laughs> so, you know, this was all seemed kind of cool and he didn't want to not be involved in it. But I mean, he was, you know, looking at what Tesla was proposing of bringing power freely to everybody in the world. And, you know, Morgan is thinking, uh, I don't know. I invested a whole lot of money in equipment that charges people. Uh, for power. So, um, Morgan, Morgan is playing m many sides, uh, in, in this particular game. Yeah. I think the movie does mention that briefly. It talks about how Tesla has this idea yeah. of, yeah, just power for all. Nobody controls it. It's all for everybody. And yeah, I, I definitely did get the impression that, uh, eh, some of the people that had business interests in here is like, well, you can't really make money off of that <laughs> Yep, <laughs> and push that that way. <laughs> Um, but again, it goes back to sort of, you know, Tesla's idealism. Um, and, you know, also I should point out, you know, also reveals that Tesla, although a genius and gave us, you know, amazing things from electric motors, long distance, electricity, transmission, radio, remote control, robots. I mean, the whole, the list goes on in stunning, but he also made mistakes. You know, not only was he thinking that he could send power through the earth, but I mean, he also came up with, you know, crazy ideas after the Wright brothers had done, you know, their, um, their first flight, he, he declared that planes were too heavy. They'd never fly. Um, or, and he preferred the dirigibles by count Zeppelin at the time, hmm. you know, contrary to, he made fun of, of Einstein later in his life and suggested that you could split an atom and you wouldn't get any power out of it. Hmm. So, I mean, you have to put, you know, I mean, Edison also did, you know, crazy things. He, you know, thought that he could. Um, you know, make a telephone that would allow you to speak to the dead. Um, you know, so inventors, you know, have mistakes. <laughs> I guess we only remember the ones that work, not necessarily <laughs> the ones that. Well, it, it sort of batting average. And I would say, yeah. you know, Tesla and to be honest, even, you know, Edison's batting average were extraordinary. Yeah. And I mean, that makes perfect sense because it's not necessarily, I mean, inventors may be some of the more out there because they're coming up with things that nobody's ever thought of before, but that's the same for everything. I mean, every, 
businesses and projects yeah. and yeah. you're talking about even with Edison, you know, I'm sorry, with, with uh, Morgan investing in a lot of different things. The reason why people do that is because some of them don't work. Businesses don't work. And so that's they don't right. fail. And that's, that's, that's exactly how, right. Yeah. That's <laughs> just how it works. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's how it works. <laughs> that's just how it works. <laughs> uh, well, according uh, at the end of the movie, uh, Tesla is working on his tower in Long Island in 1901. And Morgan comes to visit and says that her father, father knows that Tesla is in deep debt. All he asked for was a way to send stock quotes. He mentioned that across the Atlantic. And now Tesla is going on record saying that he's getting messages from Mars. Uh, at the very end of the movie, we see Tesla going to ask Morgan for more money. He has some other ideas too, photographing through using the electrical impulses of the brain, a beam of microscopic yep. particles traveling close to the speed of light that will stop an army in its track at 250 miles away. Uh, and a uh, a squadron of airplanes get swiped from the sky with this beam. Morgan just isn't even listening anymore in the movie. And then Tesla's in tears. He walks away. We find out at the very end that uh, Tesla outlived Westinghouse, Edison, and Morgan. He died alone at a hotel in uh, 19, or 1943 at 87 years old, January 7th. How well did the movie do showing the end of the story for Tesla? I think, well, um, one of the saddest parts about the research that I was doing, I was lucky enough, I was at the uh, Library of Congress going through, you know, various documents of Tesla. And the, the librarian said, there's this other box back here. <laughs> and it was, you know, of his business notes to J.P. Morgan. Um, and it was just stunning to sort of see, and it was sad to sort of see this great man and inventor basically plead mm. with J.P. Morgan for a little bit more money to do these things. And Morgan... You know, you can look at him as, a, you know, a robber baron who, you know, wanted to crush, you know, any competition. But I mean, he also, you know, was a businessman who was realizing that Tesla was not delivering. And why should he continue to throw money down what he was looking at as a rat hole? Um, because this idea of putting power into the earth um, was um, being proven not as effective as what Marconi was doing as far as sending, you know, wireless communications via radio or, you know, what, you know, Westinghouse and others were doing as far as sending electricity over long distances. So, um, yes, I think it was a, you know, sort of sad ending. There are lots of, um, uh, you know, I think what the movie didn't point out, which I thought could have been simply because his later years were focused around pigeons of all things. Um, he would take to going to New York you know, parks, Bryant park in particular, and feeding pigeons off his arms, et cetera. And one great story was, you know, he was getting an award from the American Electrical Engineer Association. And during the first part of this ceremony, you know, Edison, you know, Tesla was all dressed up. He was, you know, seemingly, you know, uh, alert to live, et cetera. And they were then going to go across the street to actually present the award to him at another banquet. And he disappeared. <laughs> and so everybody was looking all over, you know, tarnation as to where was the, you know, the man of the hour. Um, and one of the organizers, um, after, you know, about 15 frantic minutes of looking for him, thought, well, maybe he's in Bryant Park. And there he was in his tuxedo, his arms out. There were pigeons on his head. They were all over his body. And, and the organizer says, <laughs> um, yeah, you want to come back? <laughs> we got an award for you. <laughs> and they started questioning that and award. <laughs> so, so he comes back into the room, you know, and he, you know, this organizer gets rid of all the pigeons very nicely and brings him back and Tesla delivers a great speech. And we're just going to, okay, what was that all about? <laughs> well, you, you're talking about Morgan not giving him money and, and with Tesla kind of pleading. Do we know if Tesla ever regret, regretted tearing up basically a billion dollars since money was something? Uh, there's no evidence that he did. Nope. Um, I think he just, you know, Here's the, here's the interesting point in, in a, another short story. After he did Niagara Falls, which was stunning, I mean, and everybody was claiming that this was the greatest engineering accomplishment of the entire century. You know, for this man who was born, you know, at the stroke of midnight, you know, sort of locked in between being in today and being in tomorrow. When he was in today, you know, he did these remarkable things, but he got bored. He was thinking, yeah, I've done that. I've sent, you know, what am I supposed to do now? Send it 500 miles? Yeah, boring. So he comes up with this whole new idea of creating a whole new science that he referred to as telematonics, or we would refer to as robotics. And in this amazing demonstration, right at the time of the Spanish-American War, he 
builds a pond in the middle of the old Madison Square Garden and puts a um, remote controlled boat uh, into this water and bedazzles these people with having signals sent to this boat and have it go around, you know, the pond, move forward, move backwards. And the whole crowd's going, you know, because nobody had ever seen this before. I mean, this this was total magic. I mean, of, of a, a boat moving by itself. Um, and so he's got the, the crowd in the palm of his hands being the showman. And then he turns to the crowd and he says, does anybody want to ask the boat a question? <laughs> and the crowd goes, you know, who asks boats a question? And, you know, so there must have been some math nerd in the back who said, okay, what's the square root of 16? And Tesla, he's got his hand hidden underneath the control system by, you know, the pond and flips the switch so that the lights on the boat flash four times, the square root of 16. The crowd goes nuts. <laughs> you know, but for Tesla, you know, this was, it's not just a boat who could deliver, you know, ammunition or bombs to blow up, you know, Spanish in Havana Harbor, but it was for him the first embodiment of a, um, a non-biological being. Mm. It was um, a machine that embodied a human mind. Um, it was something that not only would, you know, follow directions, but at some point, this artificial intelligence that he was foreseeing, you know, at least a hundred years before anybody really got down to making it, he foresaw would allow this machine to make a decision as to what it ought and what it ought not wow. to do. Wow. I want to, the, with the crowd just being amazed by that and talking about magic, you know, th we think throughout history, a lot of times when Somebody doesn't understand what's going on. It's magic. But a lot of times there's also kind of a demonic aspect thrown into it. Did anybody ever denounce Tesla for that reason? Like thinking that what he was doing was some sort of, you know, supernatural or, or something in that way? There were a few comments, but to be honest, they were sort of minimalized. Like, you know, maybe I didn't follow them up as much <laughs> no, as just... I probably might have because I was still going, whoo, this is you know, pretty fantastic. No, I think generally he was, you know, viewed as, um, this magician, um, even though, you know, there were some, you know, religious fanatics who thought that lightning was something that God should control and that what the heck was he doing, yeah. you know, trying to take over a power of nature or of God, but all in all, I mean, he brought wonders, yeah. um, and wonderment to, um, people who watched his various demonstrations. Uh, okay, speaking of demonstrations, I've had about going back to the movie. At the very end, I don't know why, for some reason, there's Ethan Hawke as Nikola Tesla singing the Tears for Fears song, Everybody Wants to Rule the World. So I have to ask, what are your thoughts on that? <laughs> um, this is when you sort of give um, artistic <laughs> license to a Hollywood Tesla director. never actually sang that song? Are you telling me Tesla never actually sang Tears for Fears? <laughs> You know, I missed, I missed that somewhere <laughs> in, in my various <laughs> research, um, but <laughs> yeah, I, I thought that was, that was interesting. I, I had to th ask that. <laughs> now, even though we have been talking about the 2020 movie, you did write a great article for the Daily Beast called What the Hell Has Hollywood Got Against Nikola Tesla? And it talks about the 2017 movie, The, the Current War, and how Tesla only got 15 minutes of screen time. I'll make sure to include a link to that article for anyone listening so you can go read it. Why do you think overall, you kind of talked about this in the very beginning, but overall, why do you think Tesla has been not really portrayed as much? And when he has, uh, to quote your article, uh, merely an eccentric crank. The honest answer is I'm not sure. I mean, I would guess that it's hard to portray, um, particularly on film, you know, the intricacies of somebody who's thinking cerebrally. Mm, I mean, yeah. it's, um, uh, you know, Edison is somewhat, you know, you can watch him move things around the table, you know, what's there to do? I mean, and so you get in actually, even the, the most recent movie, a lot of times of just staring at Ethan Hawke, who I thought did a great job, but looking seriously as though he's yeah. thinking, <laughs> well, that's nice. Fascinating. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I know. So I think in part it was, you know, that you just didn't know how to deal with this, um, brilliant cerebral, um, and in part quacky you know, sort of pe a person, I mean, you've had him portrayed by, um, you know, Chris, you know, um, kind of, what's his name uh, by a variety of characters, but you know, overall, you know, until this most recent movie, he hasn't really been the center of 
a movie, which is why, you know, going back to your initial question, I'd give them an A for <laughs> finally realizing that this is somebody worthy of, um, you know, a movie. Um, and in the past, they has been a very minor yeah, character. Well, maybe someday they'll actually do a movie about the beginning of his life because that it might be hard to see somebody thinking and turn that into a movie. But it sounds like the, his early life would be an amazing story. Oh, I think story. the beginning of his life was, was quite formative and quite yeah, dramatic. Yeah. So the other thing I think the movie missed um, that I wish they had done more of is just, you know, he comes across in the movie as sort of um, grumpy, um, you know, always kind of, you know, um, reserved and, you know, in, into his own thoughts. He was actually quite a social, charming, you know, character. Um, and we got introduced to the Johnsons briefly in the movie. Robert um, Johnson was the editor of um, the uh, one of the most popular magazines of the era. And he and his wife had this intellectual salon that they'd bring various people over to. And I mean, you, you know, Tesla, you know, and somebody like Mark Twain became buddies. <laughs> Um, and they would, you know, after dinner at the Johnson's, they'd go back to Tesla's laboratory and they were like little boys. They were shooting, you know, um, electrical sparks across the room. They were, you know, dancing around with lighted, you know, bulbs, Mark Twain, <laughs> you know, it's similar things with John Muir with, you know, um, I guess, you know, uh, sculptors. I mean, so he was an engaging, um, sort of likable, you know, man despite his genius and his quirks. Uh, and that side, I don't think came as through as much as would have made him human and charming. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a fascinating story. What is your favorite story about Tesla? I think it's, um, you know, I'd go back to this um, remote controlled boat uh, in the um, in the pond in the water or in the uh, um, Madison Square Garden. And why it's important is because a few weeks after that, Marconi tried the same experiment um, and, you know, built his own pond. Uh, and he was, you know, brought in a bunch of military officers. Again, remember, it's the beginning of the Spanish-American War. And he had on one side of the pond, he referred to it as the Spanish ship. And then his little remote control thing had little tiny bombs or, you know, explosives that he maneuvered his, his, his boat over to dock right next to the Spanish ship and he was going to punch the button so that he'd demonstrate to the military that this was a way of blowing up, you know, the evil Spanish ships. The problem is Marconi hadn't figured out how to do individualized communications or wireless communications. So he punches the button and the Spanish ship is just fine. But in the background where, um, uh, you know, he had been, um, you know, storing these little miniature bombs it just went, <laughs> <laughs> and you know, so smoke and you know, um, noise and everything, you know, sort of fills the arena. And poor Marconi is sort of sitting there and thinking, as you said, oops, <laughs> did he not test it beforehand? So, I mean, uh, it, it sort of makes the point that not only was Tesla thinking outside the box and, and moving beyond to think about a whole new realm of artificial intelligence and robotics, but he also, you know, was more advanced in his technical ability in this case of sending individualized messages that would distinguish between when you sent you know a message to the back room versus when you send it to the boat <laughs> so, My, uh, small difference just, but pretty important <laughs> pretty important one. yeah yeah well thank you so much for coming on and chat about tesla i know you've written numerous books including a biography on tesla himself so for someone listening to this who wants to learn more about the real man can you Share a bit about your book as also where they can learn more about your work. Um, sure. I mean, as you might imagine, I've got a website, uh, richardbunson.com. Um, and there it includes descriptions of the various books and some of the reviews and ways to um, purchase it. And if anybody does, I sure hope you like it. Would welcome feedback. Okay, I'll make sure to include links to that in the show notes for this episode. Thanks so much for your time. Appreciate it. You take care. This episode of Based on a True Story was produced by me, Dan LeFebvre. I'd like to thank Richard Munson for sharing his expertise about the historical accuracy of the 2020 movie Tesla. If you want to learn more about the real Tesla, be sure to pick up a copy of Richard's fantastic book called Tesla, Inventor of the Modern. And while you're at it, check out his website that he mentioned at the end there to see all his other books too. 
As always, you can find links to his books in the show notes for this episode, as well as on the show's home on the web, based on a true story podcast.com. Okay, now it's time for the answer to our two truths and a lie game from the beginning of the episode. And as a refresher, here are the two truths and one lie. Number one, Tesla abhorred jewelry on women. Number two, one of the driving forces in Tesla's life was to please his grandmother. Number three, at one time when Tesla was about to win an award, he disappeared to go feed pigeons in a park. Did you find out which one is a lie? Let's start with number one, Tesla abhorred jewelry on women. That is true. As Richard explained, while Tesla was a genius, he also had some unique qualities like abhorring jewelry on women or getting a rash when he saw a peach and counting his steps starting to walk over if they weren't divisible by three. That brings us to number two. One of the driving forces in Tesla's life was to please his grandmother. That's the lie. Richard pointed out that it was pleasing his father that was a driving force in Tesla's life, not his grandmother. That means number three is also true. At one time when Tesla was about to win an award, he disappeared to go feed pigeons in a park. That was a great story that Richard told. It was in New York when Tesla was about to win an award from the American Electrical Engineer Association when he disappeared. And they found him in Bryant Park wearing his tux with his arms out and pigeons on his head and all over his body. Last but not least, it's time now to let you know how long it took to create this episode. If you're a longtime listener to the podcast, you'll know I like to share this information just to help you appreciate all the podcasts that you listen to for free just a little bit more. After all, a huge majority of podcasts are like mine, completely free to listen to, but that does not mean that they're free to create. Quite the opposite. They can cost a lot of money sometimes, and almost every podcast out there has higher costs than money. They have high cost in time the time it takes to learn the technical side, to research the episodes, to record them, to edit them, and so on. But I only have the stats for my show. So with that in mind, today's episode took me a total of 32 hours to create. To make it clear, that's only my time. Obviously, Richard has spent way more time researching his fantastic biography on Tesla, so 32 hours doesn't include any of that time. And to be more specific, That isn't even all of my time because that 32 hours is only the time that it took for me to produce this one episode. It doesn't include all the time that I spend building and maintaining the Based on a True Story website, finding new guests, scheduling them, and logistics of that, the email newsletter, social media, all those things that don't have anything to do with making today's episode, but are still required to make the overall podcast. In a nutshell, this podcast may be free to listen to, but it is not free to create. And that's why I'm so thankful for the sponsors whose ads you've heard on this episode. You can find out more information about them over at basedonatruestorypodcast.com slash advertisers. But they're not the only ones helping to keep this show alive. There are wonderful people just like you who are helping to keep this show financially going. So if you found value in today's episode, and if you're using a podcast 2.0 app that supports boosting with crypto, I'd appreciate that. Otherwise... I hope you enjoyed today's episode enough to share it with a friend and maybe even consider helping to support the next episode over at based on a true story podcast.com slash support. Once again, that's based on a true story podcast.com slash support until next time. Thanks so much for listening and I'll chat with you again really soon.